Hello everyone. In this example, we were asked to evaluate this expression, which is finding the derivative with respect to x of the integral from x squared to x cubed of sine of t dt. In order to differentiate this integral defined function, we're going to have to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. And in particular, we're going to have to use that first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. This relationship is only going to hold true when that integral that we are trying to differentiate is in this particular form. So it is a requirement that the lower limit of integration is some constant number a, and the upper limit of integration is our variable of interest, in this case, x. The important thing to remember is the variable inside our function and that we're differentiating with respect to should not be the same as the variable that is showing up in our limits of integration. Right? Technically, these limits of integration are these t values, and to have it vary, we're going to let this t value be some other variable x. So we can observe right away that the function we are trying to differentiate this integral from x squared to x cubed of sine of t dt is not of that particular form for which the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus applies. So what we're going to have to do is work around that issue. We will use some of our algebraic properties of integrals to help us work around this issue. But first, we're going to have to define a related function, but one for which the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus would apply. So if we weren't working with the integral from x squared to x cubed of our sine function, but instead the integral from a to x of our sine function, well, then we could apply the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's go ahead and call this function g of x, at least for now. Well, then the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus would tell us that the derivative of this integral function, that is g prime of x, would just be equal to the integrand function evaluated at that variable x. So that would give us sine of x. And so this observation is actually going to help us evaluate the derivative of the integral we are interested in. But to help keep things straight, I want to make a quick little substitution because we're going to make some other substitutions throughout this process. So to make the substitution step that I'm about to perform a bit easier to see and follow, I want to go back to this uh, definition for this g of x function. And instead of calling that variable x, let's uh, swap it out with some other placeholder variable. Let's go ahead and use u. And so not much has changed, just kind of replacing our x variable with a placeholder variable I'm calling u. So our fundamental theorem of calculus is still going to apply because our integral is going from the constant number a to our variable u. The t variable inside here doesn't really matter. We're integrating sine of t dt. And the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that the derivative of that function, and now we're taking the derivative with respect to u here, is just going to be our integrand function evaluated at that upper limit of integration, that variable u. So we just get sine of u for our derivative. So the next question is, well, how do we deal with something like x cubed in our upper limit of integration? Well, all we have to do is set u equal to x cubed. But if we set u equal to x cubed, our derivative here would not just become sine of x cubed, because that would just be the derivative of g with respect to u still. We would want the derivative of g with respect to x, right? And so that means we'd have to differentiate g of x cubed, which would require the chain rule. I'll write out some of those steps in a bit, but there's a bit more manipulation we have to do before we're actually ready to perform those steps. What I mean by that is the other condition that we require in order to use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one is that our lower limit of integration is some constant a. It doesn't matter what that constant is, but it has to be a constant. It cannot be a variable like x squared. So the way we get around this issue is by rewriting our integral as the sum of two integrals and use some of those algebraic properties that we have that allow us to manipulate our integrals. If we think about uh, x squared and x cubed as being some numbers along a number line, well, then there's going to be some number in between them. Let's go ahead and call that number a constant number a. So we can rewrite this as the integral from x squared to a of our function plus the integral from a to x cubed of our function. And now our second integral is closer to that desired form that we want, right? We have the variable part in our upper limit of integration and the constant part in our lower limit of integration. The first integral, though, is not of the desired form. We really would like to have that x squared in the upper limit 
and A in the lower limit. But we have a rule that tells us exactly how to flip those limits of integration. All we have to do is multiply the entire integral or the integrand by negative one. So we can rewrite our first integral as the integral from A to X squared of, we could put the negative sign inside or outside of the integral, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna go ahead and put it inside. And so the integral from a to x squared of negative sine of t dt, and we have to add to that the integral from a to x cubed of sine of t dt. All right, so let's go back down to our green formula here. That's gonna help us figure out how to differentiate these two integrals. What we've seen so far is that if we wanna differentiate this function g with respect to u, we just get sine of u, but we're eventually gonna be differentiating with respect to x, and so if we want to differentiate g of u with respect to x, well then we have to use the chain rule. It'll be the derivative of g with respect to u, we'll call that g prime of u, which would just be our sine of u, but then we have to also multiply that by the derivative of our inside function, we can call that u prime or du dx, depending on which notation you prefer. So now we have everything set up to perform our differentiation, so let's go ahead and get to that. We're gonna differentiate this first integral first. Remember, all of this is still equal to the original integral we are trying to differentiate. It's just expressed in a different form. And so now we're really just using this slightly modified version of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus that helps us work with these compositions of functions. And all this really says is you do that first step like you normally do in the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, just evaluate your integrand function at that upper limit of integration. But that second step that you have to do is multiply by the derivative of what you're plugging into your integrand function, multiply everything by the derivative of that upper limit of integration. All right, so that means if we differentiate this first integral, Following these steps down here, our function g prime is just our integrand function, so that'll be negative sine. But we don't evaluate our sine function at t, we evaluate our sine function at that upper limit of integration or the inner function in our composition. So that'll be x squared, and then we have to multiply that by the derivative of the inner function, and so we'll pick up a factor of 2x when we do that. And so we're not done here because we have to also differentiate the second integral, and those steps will be very similar. First, the process of differentiation kind of cancels out the integral, but it's not gonna give us sine of x, it's gonna give us sine of that upper limit of integration, sine of x cubed, and then by the chain rule formula, we have to multiply by the derivative of that inner function, the derivative of x cubed, remember, is three x squared. So now we can just simplify this a little bit, we could do some factoring if we want, but I don't think that is really necessary. I always like to write the positive terms first. So let's re-express this as 3x squared times sine of x cubed minus 2x times sine of x squared. That is how we can find the derivative of this integral defined function using the fundamental theorem of calculus part one and the chain rule. This is definitely what is considered the proper way to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus part one to find the derivative of an integral defined function like in the example we have here. But technically for this example, we could also use the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus to help us with this process. And it would actually probably be more straightforward for this example. So let me quickly go ahead and run through what I mean by that and how we could have also used the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus to assist us in this example. So another way we could have approached this example is using the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, but this is not considered the proper approach to a problem like this. And at the end of this example, I'll talk a little bit about why that is the case. But if we are using the fundamental theorem of calculus part two to help us with this problem, well, the first thing we're going to do is actually evaluate our integral before we try to differentiate, right? The first part allows us to kind of do that differentiation process without evaluating our integral. Let's go ahead and see what happens when we switch our steps around. We should get the same answer as our previous approach. So we can't forget that we're still gonna have to take the derivative of our result here. The first thing we're doing is our integration work. 
So in order to evaluate our definite integral, we need an antiderivative, and we have to remember the antiderivative of sine of t is negative cosine of t. And so our next step, according to the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, is in order to evaluate this definite integral. And so I'm going to go ahead and continue and finish our work up here. We're almost done. Our next step is to actually use our antiderivative, evaluate our antiderivative at the upper and lower limit of integration, and take that difference. Well, if we evaluate our antiderivative at the upper limit of integration, we get negative cosine of x cubed. And we have to subtract away from that our negative antiderivative, so that'll turn it into addition, evaluated at our lower limit of integration. And so that'll give us positive cosine of x squared. Remember, we have not differentiated with respect to x yet. That is the step we are saving for last and we are ready to do now. And so if we want to differentiate negative cosine of x cubed with respect to x, we're going to have to use the chain rule. And we're going to have to use a chain rule as well for our second term. So what is the derivative of our outer function, negative cosine? Well, that's going to turn into positive sine. We evaluate that at our inner function, x cubed, and then we multiply that by the derivative of our inner function. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So that's our first term. We have to also differentiate using the chain rule, our second term, and the derivative of cosine of x squared is going to be negative sine of x squared times 2x. And now, well, if we reorder our factors a little bit, we see that our first term is 3x squared times sine of x cubed, and our second term is negative 2x times sine of x squared. We get the same answer either way. So I think the second approach is a bit more straightforward and easier to follow, but it's not usually considered the proper way to evaluate one of these problems or to solve an example like this, and this is the reason why. The reason why is it assumes that there actually exists an antiderivative function that we can find or write down. In this problem, our integrand function, the function we are trying to integrate, is sine, and we happen to know the antiderivative of that function. So we're able to go through all this step and figure out our derivative of our integral pretty quickly. However, that is not always the case. The integrand function we might have instead of sine could be something much more complicated that would be very tedious to find the antiderivative of, or even worse, it could be a function that does not have an antiderivative. So an interesting fact is there's actually way more functions out there that we can't find the antiderivative of than there are functions we can find the antiderivative of. We just don't really focus on those functions we can't find the antiderivative of because, well, we wouldn't be able to use things like the fundamental theorem of calculus when working with them. But just one example of a function that does not have an antiderivative that we can write down as a nice formula, like negative cosine of t, is e to the t squared. So if we wanted to evaluate this example, like take the derivative with respect to x of the integral from x squared to x cubed of e to the t squared dt, we could only use the first approach using the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, right, where we had to break this integral up into two integrals, flip one, and then take the derivative using the chain rule. There's no way we could even uh, attempt this uh, example using the second approach because we would never be able to write down an antiderivative formula for e to the t squared. 